Could these evil experiments be the reason why you are alive today? Dr. Joseph Stokes Jr. back in 1947 did an experiment with a bunch of unsuspecting folks, mainly prisoners. They were lured in with promises of chocolate milkshakes. My milkshake has brought the boy to the yard. Little did they know, those shakes were packed with a not-so-sweet surprise. Livers containing the hepatitis virus and feces teeming with the same nasty bug. Let's add some liver and duty. Here's a little bit for you. And you. And for you too, my sweet friend. Bottoms up, my brave warriors. Drink, 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 drink. Stokes, the mastermind behind this operation, handpicked these individuals based on their clean health records, making them the perfect guinea pigs for his little virus spreading escapade. Now, what happened next was a bit of a roller coaster. These poor souls, innocently sipping away at their tainted treats, ended up becoming unwitting carriers of the virus. And guess what? They probably passed it on to their fellow inmates, like a twisted game of tag. Stokes wasn't done there. Oh, no. In 1950, he upped the ante by infecting 200 female prisoners with hepatitis, all in the name of science. Sure, Stokes' experiments did shed some light on hepatitis, revealing that having one type didn't make you immune to another. And hey, he even dabbled in disease control strategies. But let's not forget the dark side of this tale. These folks were used as mere pawns in the Stokes' quest for knowledge, their rights and well-being tossed aside like yesterday's news. It's a classic case of scientific progress at the expense of basic human decency. In the end, it's not just about what we discover, but how we go about discovering it that truly matters. In ancient Egypt, where the pharaohs were like the original reality TV stars, Herophilus rolls up and says, hey, Ptolemy, can I cut open some criminals for science, you know? And Ptolemy's like, sure, why not? So Herophilus gets the green light and starts slicing and dicing. The cherry on top. He did all these slicing and dicing while all of them were alive. This is called vivisection. He reportedly did vivisections on about 600 living prisoners. Now you might be thinking, That's so messed up. But hold on to your sandals because Herophilus was a pioneer. He figured out how the brain works, how the eyes see, and even how babies are made. All thanks to his trusty knife and a bunch of unlucky prisoners. He'd cut open a dude and be like, aha, so that's where the liver is. And then he'd high five his buddy Aracertus, who was probably thinking, dude, this is sick, but also kind of awesome. So what would this do? <laughs> but let's be real, even in ancient times, people were like, yo, Herophilus, that's messed up. So after he kicked the bucket, human dissection was banned for centuries. It was like a 2000 year timeout for the medical community. Fast forward to today, and we're all reaping the benefits of Herophilus' mad skills. Sure, he was a bit of a weirdo, but without him, we wouldn't know half the stuff we know about the human body. So next time you get a checkup, remember the guy who cut open criminals for science, Herophilus, the original mad scientist of anatomy. Now we're going to talk about a real doozy of an experiment that would make even the most twisted mad scientist cringe. It's called the Monster Study. And it's all about how your upbringing can mess with your speech, especially if you're a stutterer like yours truly. So back in the 1930s, this guy named Wendell Johnson, who was a professor at the University of Iowa, decided he was going to try and cure his own stuttering problem. And let me tell you, he went about it in the most messed up way possible. He teamed up with one of his students, Mary Tudor, and they cooked up this plan to mess with a bunch of kids from a local orphanage. Here's how it went down. They split the kids into two groups. One group got all the love and positive feedback for their speech, while the other group got treatments like how Cinderella got treated by the stepmom. I'm talking harsh criticism, ridicule, the whole nine yards. Okay, now read from the text, Tom. Subscribe to this channel. Very good. Now everybody subscribe to this channel. Here's a cookie for a good boy. Now, Timmy, your turn.
like this video. It's like this video. You are an idiot. You nimcompoop. Hup, everyone who doesn't like this video. You bad boy. Johnson's fellow academics were like, Dude, what the heck, man? But the University of Iowa decided to keep it all hush-hush. Probably because they didn't want people to think they were running some kind of twisted human experiment lab. The worst part is, the kids who got the harsh treatment ended up developing serious speech problems that stuck with them for life. It's like they were cursed. In 2001, the university finally owned up to it and said, It's our bad, guys. But it was a little too late for those kids. Let's now get into the Little Albert experiment. It's all about how you can turn a cute little baby into a blubbering mess with just a few tricks up your sleeve. So, back in 1919, this guy named John B. Watson, who was a professor at Johns Hopkins University, decided he was going to mess with a baby's head. He teamed up with his buddy, Rosalie Rayner, and they cooked up this plan to take a nine-month-old kid named Albert from a hospital without even asking his mom. First, they made sure Albert was a happy, healthy little guy. <laughs> Then, they started exposing him to all sorts of furry animals, like a white rat, a dog, and even a rabbit. Every time Albert saw one of these critters, they'd blast him with a loud, unpleasant noise. Here's how it went down. White rat. Dog. Bunny. Cockroach. Cockroach start flying. After a while, poor little Albert started associating the cute animals with the scary noise, and he'd freak out every time he saw them. Watson was like, Aha! I've done it! I've proven that you can condition a baby's emotions. And he even published his findings in a fancy science journal, where he was highly commended. But here's the thing. Watson and Rayner never tried to undo the damage they'd done to Albert's psyche. They just left him there, scared of bunnies and rats for the rest of his life. And to top it all off, they never even got Albert's mom's permission to mess with her kid in the first place. In the land of Edinburgh, there lived two chaps who were about as sharp as a bag of wet mice. Crashing Eddie reporting for duty! Their names? Burke and Hare, the dynamic duo of death and dismemberment. Now, these two knuckleheads had a real problem on their hands. They needed to find a way to make a quick buck. So, what's a couple of scoundrels to do when they're strapped for cash and have a hankering for some mischief? Start a body snatching business, of course. It was the perfect plan, or so they thought. You see, back in those days, the only way for anatomists to get their hands on some fresh meat for dissection was to either wait for a criminal to be executed or to go grave robbing. And let's just say that Burke and Hare weren't exactly the patient type. Now, you might be wondering, how did these two Muppets manage to pull off such a dastardly scheme? Between 1827 and 1828, Burke and Hare went on a chilling spree, snuffing out more than a dozen people staying at their boarding house. Come inside, nothing to worry. Stay here for only a buck. You good looking, sir. Come and stay with us. You look like you have a healthy pair of lungs. Well, it all started to reveal itself with a little old lady named Dockerty. Poor Marjorie. She had the misfortune of being the last victim in Burke and Hare's twisted game of who can supply the most corpses. Of course it's us. They sold these poor souls' bodies to a Robert Knox, who was an anatomist. Knox didn't seem to bat an eye at the suspiciously fresh corpses Burke and Hare were peddling. He conducted detailed dissections and comparative studies of various species, shedding light on the similarities and differences between human anatomy and that of other animals. But their sinister scheme came crashing down when the police stumbled upon the body of their last victim, Marjorie Dougherty, in Knox's possession. Burke spilled the beans during questioning, throwing hair under the bus in the process. It was him and him alone. In exchange for ratting out his partner in crime, Hare got off scot-free. The whole affair caused quite a stir, sparking outrage and demands for change. Perhaps it's a world that needs changing. And change did come, in the form of the Anatomy Act of 1832. This law aimed to fix the cadaver shortage problem by allowing bodies from places like asylums and hospitals to be used for medical study. We're about to dive into some serious psychological shenanigans, courtesy of Professor Philip Zimbardo, 
and his merry band of Stanford students. It all went down back in 1971, when the good professor decided to play a little game of let's pretend we're prison guards and prisoners. Now you might be thinking, but wait, isn't that just a fancy way of saying let's torture each other for fun? Let's play a game. Well, you're not wrong, but Zimbardo had a plan. He wanted to see how quickly a bunch of regular students could turn into sadistic prison guards, given the right, or should I say, wrong circumstances. So he rounded up a bunch of students, divided them into guards and prisoners, and set up shop in the university's basement. It was like a real life version of The Sims, but instead of building dream houses, Zimbardo was building a nightmare prison. Within 24 hours, things went from zero to 100 real quick. The prisoners started rebelling, and the guards, well, they went full on Darth Vader on them. Zimbardo watched in horror as the guards started using psychological warfare to keep the prisoners in line. It was like a twisted version of good cop, bad cop, but with no good cops in sight. The prisoners, bless their hearts, tried to keep it together, but eventually they just gave up and accepted their fate. After just six days, Zimbardo had seen enough. The experiment was supposed to last two weeks, but he pulled the plug when he realized that his little game was turning into a real-life horror show. It's a filthy goddamn horror show. Now you might be wondering, but wait, didn't the prisoners know they could leave at any time? You could leave any time. Well, yeah, but that's the thing about psychological experiments. They can really mess with your head. It's like when you're watching a scary movie and you yell at the screen, don't go in there, you idiot. But the character does it anyway. I told you not to go there. I told you not to go there. These shocking experiments, as twisted and unethical as they were, paved the way for many of the medical advancements we enjoy today. Their dark legacy lives on in the ethical guidelines and safeguards that now govern medical research.